to the She Leads podcast. I'm your host, Adrian Garland, CEO and founder of She Leads Media, a global media company dedicated to the advancement of women leaders and entrepreneurs worldwide. I'm also an adjunct professor at NYU and Rice University, where I teach on the topic of entrepreneurship. I'm a mom to two wonderful young men and married to my best friend from college. Join me each week as I dive into raw conversations with remarkable, uncompromising, and inspirational women entrepreneurs and leaders. My hope is that these conversations and their advice will encourage you to put yourself out there and gain the visibility that you and all women deserve. We're all about stripping away the sugar-coated conversations and moving boldly in the direction of our magnificent dreams. For far too long, women have been conditioned to soften their words, modify their actions, and show up in the world to conform to outdated at best and harmful at worst cultural norms and ideals. Why? To keep those who are outside of the power structures from gaining power, prestige, wealth, and influence. This has prevented women from being recognized and respected as the powerful leaders that we truly are. The She Leads podcast is here to shine the light on all the incredible women, to encourage us to show up, speak up, and showcase the amazing work we do, speak with confidence about the innovative and transformational thoughts that we have, and celebrate the positive impact that we are making in this world, both personally and professionally. So let's do this. Let's lead. Hello, and welcome back to the She Leads Podcast. This episode is brought to you by the She Leads Podcast Network. It's the podcast network for women by women. And I just want to mention that we are also having our annual conference in October in New York City. And I would like to invite all of you who are listening in to this podcast today to go ahead and get your tickets now because the early bird pricing ends at the end of June. So let's welcome my next guest. Her name is Stephanie Zenos, and she's a retired rocket scientist turned women's personal finance expert and speaker specializing in investing and financial independence, or like we were just talking about the Reddit guys, FI, she specializes in FI (laughs) and fire, passionate about teaching women how to manage their finances and grow their wealth. Stephanie seeks to empower women of all ages and diverse backgrounds to jumpstart their journey toward financial freedom. You can see why I cannot wait to dive into my conversation today with Stephanie. So welcome to the She Leads podcast, Stephanie. Thank you so much, Adrian. I'm so excited to be here. I am so excited to have you here and to be able to share your wisdom with the She Leads podcast audience. I think that this is a topic that people everywhere are very interested in. And yet it is a topic that is also super triggering and maybe Mm -hmm. confusing, um, and especially among women, because we definitely have not been taught how to speak about money and finance in the same ways that maybe men are. And that needs to change. We know this. But before we dive into probably a lot of practical and actionable advice, I want to talk about you, Stephanie. So you're (laughs) a retired, which is awesome, rocket (laughs) scientist. How in the world did you become a rocket scientist? Oh my gosh, it's a long story. And honestly, it's the the answer is the same answer to how I got into money. So just to give like a teeny little glimpse into my backstory. I grew up as an only child with a single mom, and we were very poor. And my mom eventually got into a relationship with a man who had money and was good looking and smart, but he was not a very kind person. And so I got to see firsthand the power of money. My mom really wanted to leave my stepfather. He was you know, physically abusive to her and to me. She didn't have the means to do so. So I became obsessed with money at a very young age. 
um, started investing at 18. And when I chose my major in college, I was like, I'm going to choose the hardest thing because the hardest thing must make the most money. So (laughs) I chose to study physics. Oh my God. (laughs) I I was so wrong. I was so wrong. But I chose to study physics because I thought, you know, that's the hardest possible major. So I better choose that. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Wow. Some of the things that we just have in our head about, you know, what we need to do in order to get where we want to go are so convoluted. And I mean, good for you. And knowing that you had the capability to accomplish everything, choosing the most difficult major, that that says a lot about you. And even though being a rocket scientist maybe was not you know, your ultimate path, I am sure that you learned so much about just life and yourself in choosing that major and in going into that field. I did. And, you know, I always tell people that fear is an incredible motivator. It's not the motivator that I would love to, you know, inspire my clients with or the women that I, you know, try to inspire with my message now around money. But Fear is an incredible motivator and I owe a lot of my success to fear. And at this point, you know, I'm creating a new story for myself and I'm kind of rewriting all of that. And I've told you this before, but talking to women about money is my dharma, right? So I really want to help people from a place of desire rather than fear and, and turn my experience into a positive experience for other women in the world. Mm, I love that so much. This is such a great place to to come from and sharing all of your knowledge and everything that you learned with women truly is so inspiring. And I love that that's the work that you're doing now. And I definitely want to, you know, focus on that because this is something that can truly help women. I, I know that there are so many statistics about when women have control of their money they don't spend it frivolously. They help communities. Mm-hmm. They help the the world ultimately. And so that's why, I mean, I've said this a million times, that's why it's so important for women to get control and command of their financial life. And it's not something to be scared of. Mm-hmm. It's something that we need to educate ourselves about. Yes, I am here for that. <laughs> I am too. So what changed for you that got you into this uh, arena of, of financial education and helping women to gain financial independence? Yeah. So for the first, you know, 10 or I guess 14 years, I was really just doing this for my own sake. So I started investing at 18, probably in the worst possible way, but like you got to learn somehow, right? And slowly by slowly, I just learned and was self-taught in terms of my personal finance education until I got to the point where I felt really solid. And then I was investing. At one point, I worked at SpaceX. I was investing like 70% of my income for future me, you know, for my, my retirement goals. And when I found myself at 32, I had enough money to retire. And a big part of that was actually building a house for some passive income, like rental property. So when I got to that place, I, I left SpaceX for the final time. And I started just thinking about what I wanted to do with the rest of my life, like what was meaningful to me, what I cared about. And I kept coming back to like helping other women. I loved money. I loved talking about money. The list was long, but I was able to pull together a couple things in there and basically say to myself, like, I've been helping people my whole life with money. I wonder if I could help people I don't know with money. And that Mm -hmm. was truly how my business was started. And I just hosted a workshop, over 100 women showed up with only three days notice. I was like, Oh, I think I'm on to something here. So (laughs) yeah, that's how that's how it was born. (laughs) I love that. That is so great. And it's true, you are onto something because we are all starving for information that does not make us feel inferior or that we are Mm -hmm. dumb. A lot of terms, even, you know, in the intro there, I talked about, you know, FI, right? And, and fire. And you, you educated me, uh, financial independence, retire early is the acronym for fire is uh, fire is the acronym for that. Um, If you start reading some of these things that can educate you, and there's a lot of terminology that is 
in there, it can be very intimidating because how are you supposed to look up some of this stuff? And I think that that is something that prevents women from doing more because women are smart. I mean, yes, it's not a lack of intelligence. No. In fact, like my clients, they're all super smart. And I hear the same things over and over again. It's like, there is so much information that how do you decide what's right for you? How do you decide who to trust? And also like, let's say you're like sifting through all this information, you're finally figuring out what to do. Most women I talk to are like, I want to understand this completely before I make a move. So they're just sitting on cash. They're not investing, right? They're waiting. They're waiting until they fully understand it instead of taking a little leap of faith and getting started without fully understanding the whole picture. And that's so critical with investing, right? We need time on our side. We don't have to be perfect. Yes. And that's something that I was going to mention. It's so amazing that you started so early. That That is of tremendous value because of the compounding effect of interest. But there are so mm-hmm. many women, you know, it's funny, I, I won't tell uh, the story fully only because uh, she's still in it, but a very good friend of my mother's. I uh, just to, to back up just so that you know. So my mother, my father passed away when I was uh, pretty young. I was uh, seven. I don't know if I was quite seven, but six, seven. And my mother was a school teacher. And she very quickly educated herself on finance in general. And she did everything that she could to sort of maximize her earning power by going and getting, you know, her teaching certificate, but then different courses on top of it that added to her income. And then she invested Mm -hmm. and took advantage of every investment vehicle that was available to her. And and today, you know, she is sitting very pretty. But not (laughs) all of her colleagues, women, you know, in the teaching field did the same. And one of her very good friends has a husband that took care of everything. And Mm -hmm. the man right now is in the hospital and I'm not sure, you know, if he's going to sort of survive it. And the woman is freaking out. She does not know how to pay bills. I mean, it's it's just crazy when, when I compare her to my mother, it's night and day. And so there's a lot yeah. of women that are in the she leads audience. They're not they're not quite, you know, that old, but we we don't have the 18 year old time on our side. We're maybe in our 40s, 50s, 60s. And I don't want the message to be like, well, too bad you're screwed. <laughs> So what, you know, without having that benefit of time on your side, what can women do today so that they can at least move toward financial independence if they're entrepreneurs, if they're starting businesses and they're not working a traditional job? Right. And I always say to people like that, please do not allow yourself to be in the like driver's seat of your finances for the first time because your partner passes away or because you get divorced. Like, don't let that be the time because you're already going to be under immense amounts of stress, right? Maybe grieving. It could be, it could be a really bad time to try to take on something big like that. So I encourage people to wherever they're at, whatever their situation, like to take baby steps towards really opening their eyes to their finances and learning bit by bit. Of course, like investing is the vehicle for generational wealth. It is the way to safety and financial independence for women, period. I'm obsessed with investing. I won't lie. Now, Mm -hmm. like if you're later in the game, right? Like, sure, you don't have time on your side. You might have to be a little savvier. And for me, the number one thing is focusing on the fees, right? So fees can really eat away at your returns. So fees that are paid to an advisor or fees that are paid like on the actual investment funds that you own, that is one of the first places I would encourage women who are a little bit later in their time horizon to focus on with their investments. And just make sure that they're not being overly conservative because I think a lot of women are willing to take on a higher level of risk than an advisor would even put them in. The questions around risk are always really terrible, right? They're like, how would you feel if you lose 10% of your portfolio and you're like, uh, bad. I don't want to lose anything. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Ter- terrible questions around like, you know, asset allocation, which is essentially choosing your mix of stocks and bonds and what you're invested in. So I think the fees is a really big one for people who are further along and don't have that same runway, like be like rigorous with 
understanding the fees in your portfolio and how your advisor gets paid if you have one. I love that. And do you do you give the advice to women to get a financial advisor or you know, especially for people that maybe they haven't invested but they are confident in themselves that they can, you know, learn what they need to learn and take the steps that they want to take. Do you think that across the board, women should have a financial advisor or do you think it's possible for them to, you know, take on some of this investment on their own? Absolutely not. I would encourage a financial advisor as a last resort. I say that if you are even moderately mildly interested in this step, if you're even asking these questions, you are capable of managing your own portfolio. Like it is just not that hard. And so if you're unwilling to do any work towards it or learn anything or spend any time on it, then sure, like an advisor is better than not investing at all, of course. But if you even have a little teeny bit of interest and time, you're willing to work with someone, you know, that's like a financial coach, for example, like me, right, to get yourself set up, you will save yourself hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in fees by not working with an advisor. So I truly yeah. think it's a last resort. Oh, my gosh. I love that you said that so much. It's so funny. I had uh, in my, you know, corporate role, I always had 401ks and I was very smart and I contributed to them at the maximum so I could get the match and all of that kind of stuff. And when I started my business, I was then not smart. Um, and I didn't open a Roth IRA. I just, I thought that, you know, the the money would come in and and then there were some years that I just didn't contribute to anything. And I really lost mm-hmm. a lot of traction. And because I had to roll my plans, or I guess I didn't have to, but I wanted to roll my plans out of the companies that I had worked for and into something, you know, independent, I rolled it into a company that provides, you know, uh, financial advice, one of the big companies. And Mm -hmm. uh, so much of my retirement got eaten up with these Mm -hmm constant trading fees because I was in this program that like rebalanced the portfolio all the time. And I was like, I'm done with this bullshit because I I wasn't getting any, I wasn't being, it wasn't growing at the pace that I knew it could grow at. And I rolled it into, you know, like a Vanguard fund that I self-manage and I don't touch it. And it's been doing amazing. And there's like (laughs) hardly any fees whatsoever. So yes, it, hallelujah, sister. Advice. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I am very, very comfortable with, you know, finances. I I was actually an economics major in my uh, undergrad and I worked in finance and everything. So I feel like I'm a little bit different than a lot of the entrepreneurs that I talk to because I am super comfortable talking about finance and numbers and I read books and I my, my two boys are very into investing. And so everybody has, mm-hmm. you know, their little... Robin Hood thing or whatever they have set up. And, and we talk about it all the time in our household. So um, Amazing. Y- it's so good. And it's fun, right? It's it's like fun. Totally. Yeah, because you want money is is not scary. But I don't I, I think that what happens and I'm just maybe projecting is that Oftentimes, women are not making the same amount of money as their male counterparts. And so we get into this, like, I want to protect what I have because I don't make as much. And so we're less willing to take on an investment because we're like, we just don't have that money to play with. Mm. I mean, the women I work with, they have the money. The thing is that no one's talking to them about it and what to do with it, right? So Mm. they just don't have the knowledge or know who to trust. So I call a lot of my clients like little dragons. They're like sitting on little piles of gold. They're like, oh, I have this money. I know I should be doing something with it, but gosh, I don't know what to do with it. Should I invest in this thing? Should I invest in that thing? Like so-and-so told me this, but I heard this on a web post. So like, what do I do? Like that's, that's actually what I see more often. And yes, we make less money. Yes, we live longer. Yes, we have less years in the workforce, which is why it's even more important that we invest. But the the thing I run into over and over again is like, who do I trust? There's so much information. Like, I just need guidance. Like, I need to understand it before I do it. 
it's important to have that competence and also confidence, right? So that you can feel good about what you're doing and be able to explain your plan in like one or two sentences, like nothing crazy. It's, it's so simple. It can be so simple. Oh my gosh, this is so good. So how, talk to me about your business and what your mission is and how you work with different clients. I say two things with my business. I want to make as many women as possible millionaires because of what you said. Women give back more. They contribute to our communities. Like we, we have a lot more in like charitable giving, right? It's so important that women are millionaires. That's one. And the other one is just to help as many women reach financial independence as possible. And, you know, right now I work with women one on one mostly, but I am at capacity and I know that I want to have a greater impact. I have seen the results from the women I've worked with over the last, you know, five or six years. And it's just incredible. It's so heartwarming, but I want to have a greater impact. And so I'm going to be developing ways to essentially work with people like in a group program so that I can reach more women. Um, I also speak, you know, at conferences, at women's groups, at tech companies. Like I'm so passionate. I could do this all day, every day. So that's me. I'm out there just chatting with women in the streets about money. And, you know, any chance I can get, Adrian, I am, I'm on it. <laughs> so do you think it's possible for a woman who like, let's say she's in her 40s, late 40s, early 50s, who is, let's say, making six figures, whether it's in a corporate job or in her own business, you know, maybe has a little saved, maybe a little bit in retirement. Do you think it's possible for a woman like that to become a millionaire without sort of grinding herself to the bone? <laughs> yeah. So it's, we're always talking about timelines, right? So I started at 18, was retired at 32. So you can do the math on how many years it took me. It took me 14 years. Mm. I started out very, very slow. I opened my account with $50. I was barely contributing those first four years. I was in college, right? Then I got my first job. I started putting in like 10%, then 15, then 20, worked my way up to like 70%, right? And eventually retired. So I had a very short time horizon. If you're starting later, right? You can either try to shorten that time horizon by having more and more of your income go into your accounts as a percent of your take-home income. Or like you can do other things too. Like I always tell people, are the way we think about work is changing, right? Yeah. Half of my clients, I'm helping them prepare either for a sabbatical or to leave corporate and start their own business. Mm. So if there is something that you are inspired to do with your life, you may not need to walk away and retire completely. Like I planned on retiring completely, but here I am preaching to women about money, you know, every chance I can get. And of course that makes money, right? I didn't plan on that. <laughs> if there's something you're passionate about doing, like, Let's reframe the idea of work. Maybe we get you in the workforce and have you contribute as much as you can for five years, but we make a plan to have you transition into something that has more sustaining power, right? Something that you would be thrilled to do for the next 10 years while you can build your portfolio. So I think yeah. there's a lot of different ways to do it. And yeah, I don't want my clients just grinding in tech forever. Like it doesn't make people happy. I know that because so many of my clients want out, right? So. Yeah. Yeah, I just think there's a, there's a lot of options out there. It's never too late. You do need to be a little smart and get a little help, but it's so, so simple. Mm, this is so good. You know, I it, a couple of things. I love that. I love the reframe of let's not think about work life as a certain portion of your life and then retirement because retirement is very different for everybody, right? And I do think that mm -hmm. if you continue to uh, do what you're passionate about, you don't consider that even working, but you could do that for the rest of your life. No one, I don't think that there's a lot of people left that are sitting on their front porches in rocking chairs. I, I think <laughs> That, right. That there are a lot of people, you know, unless you're you're physically not able to, that are doing something of meaning. And and I love this idea of like, listen, if you just want to take a break from maybe your corporate job or even entrepreneurship and, and do a sabbatical for a year or two years and write a book or whatever you want to do, lay on the beach. I just mm -hmm. think that that is so such a wonderful way to think about it. I also especially love it because I talk a lot about the skill set of 
entrepreneurship and the fact that we're not necessarily taught how to be an entrepreneur in our educational Mm -hmm. journeys. We're taught how to work for someone, right? So if we can develop the skill of entrepreneurship, we are going to be in so much control of our lives because we're not going to have to depend on a corporate job in order to earn income. And we, we need to learn to also maybe what you said, like maybe you go into a corporate role for a certain amount of time, two years, five years, but with the goal of maybe starting a business, maybe taking a year to write a book, whatever that is, and being able to move back and forth between those two worlds. That's an amazing skill set to have. Yes. And with all these women in tech, like that's the way I speak to them about it. I'm like, let's use your tech career. Let's use the benefits and let's leverage that for your financial freedom. Whether that means starting your own business or retiring early, doesn't matter. And then if you're already working for yourself, like let's leverage the business you've built to have you working less hours on things that you love doing the most. And then like, you know, get people to do the other work and try to like focus on the part that actually brings you the passion, right? Delegating is like a hard thing when you're an entrepreneur, but it can bring your business to the next level and actually help you make more money, have more time and be happier, right? It's like there's these little things that can mm. really change our lives. But I think it's usually fear in the way, right? That's that's preventing us from taking the leap or preventing us from hiring on the help. I know I've been through that at every step. Like I was terrified to take my first sabbatical from SpaceX in 2015. I was terrified to invest in my business. Like these are hard things. And you know, it's amazing to have support and communities of people who have done it before you where you can be like, okay, look, it worked for them. Yeah, it's so good. And the the more and more, especially this year, I've been focusing on like, what can I do in my business to invest in it in order to grow? And even hiring coaches that help you to think about things in a totally different way is such a worthy investment. I, I think sometimes you people look at, you know, I'm, I'm, it's an expense to have a coach, a luxury. It's not a luxury. Mm -hmm. It's something that is almost required in your business. Because if you are a solo entrepreneur, the only person that you're, you know, talking to and getting advice from is yourself, maybe your partner, maybe some friends, but you need that objective coach that's going to say, Hey, I've I've done this with other people. I see how this works. You just need to have trust in me and you can get to the next level. One of the coaches that I'm working with right now, we kind of scoped out something for my business, a, a community. If uh, anybody is interested in joining, um, I will be I will <laughs> be launching that soon. But the community and just, you know, numbers of people that are not even that big that can help your business get past the million dollar mark pretty easily. It's kind of mind blowing because it is just math and it's not complicated math. It's just math. Yeah. Yeah. And I am, I know that my inclination is a bootstrapper. I love doing things myself. I love researching the options. I love making a plan. But the moment that I give that up to another coach and get help outside of me, like, Ooh, things move so much faster. It's always been incredibly worthwhile. And I'm telling that to the women that want to work with me, right? A lot of the people that want to work with me are bootstrappers. They're like, I'm smart. I can do this myself. I've been researching. And I'm like, well, you can spend four years, you know, getting your perfect plan, or like you can have someone guide you. And it's just so worthwhile. I I have never regretted like a single time that I've hired a coach or help. It's just, yeah, it's a game changer. You know what I also love about hiring you as a financial coach, and I do hope that you quickly start a group program (laughs) so that people can join it. But I I think that, well, I guess it would really, it's very meaningful whether you're trying to grow your business or whatever. And and it's, it's what we talked about earlier. It's, it's, kind of getting that time, right? That that mm-hmm. saying, you know, what's the best time to invest or plant a tree 20 years ago? <laughs> what's the second best time right, right now? Right? And so if you yes. don't, if, if you do the research and it takes you two years and maybe you, you are confident and you know and everything, you've lost two years of the compounding yeah. effect of interest. That can be a big difference. 
a huge yeah. difference. And that's why like I talk about being 18 and making all the wrong decisions, right? Like I will show a picture of me at 18 in a ridiculous outfit, like making a terrible face. I'm like, if this girl can invest, trust me, you can invest. Like I hired an <laughs> advisor. I paid crazy fees. I was invested in dumb things, right? Like I, it was all the worst decisions. And yet like I would still not change that because I did grow my money over those four years before I like took it over myself, right? And mm. you know, you can't go back in time, but I'm glad I started when I did. And I just encourage people like make the wrong choice. That's okay. Like it's better than not than not doing it. So yeah. much better. This hits on such an important point too, because it would be so amazing when we're talking about education to literally be able to go into high schools and teach young women about investing. Mm-hmm. Because if every not everybody, but you know, everybody that I know whose kids, they have summer jobs and they make a pretty good amount of money, you know, whether it's like babysitting or, you know, lifeguarding, whatever it is that they're doing over the summer. And, you know, they, a a lot of these young women spend it on things that all teenagers (laughs) spend it on, right? But it just, it goes away. You make a couple thousand dollars for the summer. You have nothing, (laughs) you have nothing at the end of the summer. And if they just knew that like, hey, you know, maybe... Maybe you don't buy that, you know, third bathing suit or that like cute (laughs) bag, right? And we're not, and that's the other thing I actually just wanted to uh, ask you to touch on. It it actually struck me when you said that you put 70% of your income into investments. To me, I thought to myself, how did she live? Because, you know, did you sacrifice? And do you need to sacrifice today in order to get to that level tomorrow? Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Did I sacrifice? Yes, I did. I was living in LA. It is an expensive place to live. I was not making a huge salary back then, even though I was an engineer. I was never going to be able to afford to buy a house there, right? Like I even had a partner at one point that was also an engineer and he and I were like, there's no chance we'll ever afford a house. So like it was an expensive environment to be in. So did I sacrifice? Yes. But recall that like I was in this position where like money to me was safety. I was obsessed. I did not care that I was sacrificing, right? I was single focused. I was like, I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to retire. I'm going to have financial freedom. I don't care what it takes. So Mm -hmm. absolutely. But here's the thing. If I were to do it again with what I know today, I wouldn't do it that way. Mm -hmm. I would not like... I would not impact my lifestyle to the point that I did. But I was desperate, right? That was that was a trauma. That was a trauma state that I was in. So now, you know, I talk to clients and I say like, you don't have to be that desperate. I want you spending money on things that you care about. Like you have to invest in yourself today, just like you invest in yourself for the future. And that means spending money on things that bring you joy. And I want you spending as much money as possible on things that bring you joy. I want you to be happy and investing for future you. So yeah. I wouldn't do it that way again. I don't recommend that lifestyle to anyone. <laughs> but you know, there are people in the fire community, it's called lean fire, right? They are really, really lean with their expenses. They're trying to get there as quickly as possible. They don't care if they eat beans or rice the rest of their life. They just want financial freedom. And for mm-hmm. some people that, you know, that is the goal. That's great. And for other people, you know, they, they want a little extra. They want to, you know, have the juice in life or, you know, have a really juicy lifestyle. So it kind of depends where you're at too, but I wouldn't recommend that to anyone. <laughs> Good. I, and, and I like to hear that it's, it's like anything else, right? It's a choice that we make, you know, if you listen to, and I don't know enough about it, but the very little that I know, like a, a Dave Ramsey sort of encourages mm-hmm. a very, very lean lifestyle in order to, you know, get independent. And I think that what ends up happening is that you sort of resent what you have to do. And we only go go around this world one time. And so I think, I think this, just like everything else is the all or nothing mentality of like, I have to sacrifice it all now for tomorrow or, oh, I'm just going right. to, you know, we don't know if we're going to be here tomorrow. So let me just spend it all. There there has to yeah. be some place in the middle of that that is comfortable for you. And for us to know that we have the choice to dial those things up or down depending on what we feel in our hearts. 
Mm -hmm. I think that's a very empowering type of philosophy because I think sometimes too, people do think like, oh, I got to sacrifice it all now for tomorrow. And that's not true. No, no. It's back to like the same thing we said earlier is like, you know, finding a way to reframe it so that you're enjoying your life now. Make it so that the journey is so enjoyable that you don't care if it takes you 10 or 15 years to get to financial independence or longer, right? You're loving what you do. Some of my clients are like, should I get like the highest paying tech job I possibly can, even if I'm, you know, suffering and struggling and hate it? I'm like, absolutely not. Like, no way. (laughs) Yeah. No. <laughs> no, please don't. <laughs> yeah. No, that's awful. Because you know. then, right. Because then you end up like you, you sacrifice your soul and there's no, there's no price on that. And then you're going to end up paying all the money in therapy to, <laughs> to like unwind that exactly. anyway. You definitely <laughs> need to find some level of happiness. And I think sometimes kind of pulling back and not spending on things that are frivolous, whatever that means to you. I'm not here to judge what's frivolous or not. But, you know, sometimes even things like you go into TJ Maxx and you have a cart full of stuff, like literally asking yourself, do I really need all this? Do I really, really need it? Or is there this consumerism mentality that we've all been programmed to live by that is that's not our soul talking to us. So we do, I think, need to ask ourselves, do we really need this? And really, if the answer is no, then it's really not even a sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah. And I like bringing in, you know, mindfulness around it and also just like minimalism. Like what is the most important thing that I spent money on last month? What brought me the most joy? I want to spend more money on that stuff. And then everything else rigorously cut my expenses on. Like, I do not care how much I spend for my phone plan. My phone plan is $15 a month, right? I'm like, I'm not spending money on that, but I will spend tons of money on, you know, organic food and supplements and travel, like the stuff that I care about. Heck yes. And I like to say, if I look at your spending from last month, it should be blatantly obvious to me what you care about, right? I want to see you spending money on stuff you care about and everything else. Yeah, sure. Try to cut expenses on the stuff you don't care about. Yeah, because that's where you can pick up some extra money in order to invest and have that grow for your future. And then you don't even you don't even feel it, which I I love. One of the things that my mom was so good about teaching me was that, you know, it's kind of like a game, right? You, 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 if you, if you do this, if you put this here, if you experiment, it's, it's fun. And it's a game. And I think that that's what we need. That's the attitude that we need to bring to this, as long as you're not sacri- as long as you're not, not, not sacrificing, as long as you're not like, you know, harming yourself and living on the street or something like that. It can, it can be fun. Yes. I mean, I personally, I like to use the quote that like investing is supposed to make you money. It's not supposed to be fun. But for that, I'm saying we're not trading, right? We're not in there like gambling and like buying like every day, selling every day, like trying to get these tiny bits. I want to choose something that I can sit back and look at and be like, dang, 20 years later, here I am. And my, you know, some of my best investments are like 15 to 20 X. I'm like, Ooh, that's nice. That That feels good. That's a big smile. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh. I love that. So Stephanie, this is such great information. And I know that you said that you were at capacity with your one-on-one clients, but I know that everybody listening in is going to want to connect with you. So how can they do it? Because I'm sure people are going to want to get on your list for when you start your large the way that you'll work, be able to work with more people? How can they get in touch with you? Yeah, um, I'm easy to find. I'm at stephaniezenos.com or I'm on Instagram, stephanie underscore Zenos. I've got loads of good you know, freebies and information on investing. That's my favorite topic. So it's mostly investing focused. And then yeah, you can learn more about me and my programs online. I will hopefully have more capacity for one-on-one in fall. (laughs) I am like real booked right now. And that group coaching offer should be coming online this summer. So I am super, super excited just to, you know, be able to help more women. I'm thrilled. (laughs) I am so happy. You're such a light and it really does seem that you have so much confidence around investing and being able to help people. And I think that that's what women myself included need. We need someone that is 
going to be able to say like, it's okay, you can do this. Let me show you how we're in this together and and let's do it. Let's all become millionaires or more or better. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. I like the sky's the limit. Let's go for it. (laughs) Let's do it. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie, for all of your wisdom and insight and spending time with me here today. Thank you, Adrian. It's been a total pleasure. This and all of our episodes are brought to you by the She Leads Podcast Network, the podcast network for women by women. Thanks so much for listening to the She Leads Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support us, please share it with others. Make a personalized post about what you took away on social media and please leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. This helps our guests and our show to continue to gain visibility and traction. To learn more about how She Leads Media helps women to gain visibility, you can follow us on Instagram at She Leads Media or you can head on over to SheLeadsMedia.com. If you'd like to network with me and other amazing women, don't forget to join us each year for the She Leads Live conference. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon. The She Leads Podcast Network.